It is Sunday evening here in New York City and I am in desperate need of a little cozy, intentional, wind down moment for myself. I have been so not intentional with my relaxation, wind down, self care time recently. And I'm willing to blame that 100% um, on the fact that about every corner of my life decided to fall apart at the exact same fucking time, which was really nice and really fun. And you know what? Trusting the process here, trusting the whole idea of like, what's falling apart is actually falling together. What's meant to break needed to be broken, okay? I'm suckling at the teat of those affirmations. But because I've been going through it, a lot of my routines have just sort of fallen apart and I find myself being completely surprised about what I'm gonna do each day. So I'm trying to get back with it a little bit and be a little bit more intentional about how I'm spending my time so that I can pour a little bit more back into myself. So a few weeks ago, I asked you guys over on Instagram to submit some questions to me and I figured that we could go through, hang out a little bit, answer some questions while I have a little night for myself. So for dinner, I'm gonna do like a Mediterranean salmon quinoa bowl, quinoa. Salmon, topped with chickpeas, cherry tomatoes, red onion, lemon, cucumber, kalamata olives, and then a little bit of hummus and feta cheese. Sounds pretty fucking delicious to me right now. What's your type and are there any similarities between the people that you've dated? I always say that I don't have a type because I kind of hate the like concept of a type as it is typically talked about. Like, I don't think I have a physical type at all. If you lined up everyone that I've ever been interested in, everyone that I've ever had any type of any history with, none of them look similar, I don't think. Does that mean there are not physical traits I find myself drawn to? For sure, I'm not like a liar, you know? <laughs> but I don't have a physical type as in, I think it's kind of shitty to write off entire groups of people based on a physical trait. That's a belief that I hold. So no, I wouldn't say I have a physical type because there's no physical type that I wouldn't date. However, am I often attracted to men that are bald or have receding hairlines? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Have I dated quite a few of them? Yes, indeed I have. <laughs> And I'll do it again, bitch. <laughs> and I also definitely find myself more drawn to other plus size people. I think I just feel more understood right off the bat. And as a result, I feel more at ease and comfortable around other plus size people when dating. Cause obviously dating and romantic partnerships are very intimate, very physically intimate. And you know, we all have our own histories with our bodies. And I think that I just, feel more comfortable around other plus size people right off the bat in a way that takes time to develop if they're not plus size. But again, there's nobody that I wouldn't date. I would never say I wouldn't date someone based on any physical attributes. So that's why I don't often feel I have a type because yeah, there might be things I'm drawn to, but they're not important to me. Personality wise, I feel like I'm always going for lover boys, fucking obviously. Um, that is like a prerequisite to me liking you. You have to be a softie. You have to be a little bit sentimental, a little bit cringe, a little bit just mushy, gushy and gooey. That's number one. And then also I feel like I go for charisma a lot. Someone with a lot of charisma that is an introvert. I feel like we get each other. Ambition, drive, people that have something that they love, that they really fucking care about. It doesn't have to be a job, but just something that they have a lot of like passion and excitement about, that is super hot to me. I don't know, I'm trying to think of other like traits I find myself drawn to over and over again. But as long as they have the same like foundation, that I have, they're in touch with their emotions and their sensitive side. They are a lover through and through, a romantic. I'm looking for understanding in a partnership for sure. I wanna be with someone that makes me feel understood above most other things. But do I go for charisma and humor more often than not? For sure I do. A lover boy who can make me giggle a little bit. <laughs> 
and like has ambitions and can take care of business while I simultaneously do exactly that in return. I want someone that can give what I give. Opinion on dating broke guys, as in bad money management and a lack of real ambition to make more. Listen, if y'all wanna date broke guys, you can go ahead and do that, but me on the other hand, <laughs> It's not the broke part that bothers me, it's the lack of ambition part that bothers me. Money comes and goes, right? That's really not the important part here. But if you just like want someone to take care of you, I'm not gonna be your fucking girl. I'm looking for a partner, not a son. So um, it's not the broke part that is the red flag to me. It's the lack of ambition and drive to get it together and support yourself that is a red flag to me. Yeah, I just won't, I'm not, gonna be anyone's mother. I'm not gonna date someone that doesn't have a desire to contribute. What? My phone has never made that sound before. That's my alarm to take my pills, but I've never heard it play that sound. What is going on? Set a timer for 15 minutes. And now I'm gonna take my pills so that I do not forget. I started taking my vitamins at night just because I'm in habit of taking my birth control and spironolactone at night. So it just makes sense for me to do it all in one go, all in one sweep so that I don't forget, which is nice because today's video is sponsored by Care Of. Time you enjoy wasting was not wasted. If you've somehow never heard of them, Care Of is a health and wellness company that delivers high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders straight to your door every single month. I have been using Care Of for my vitamins for years now. They come in these individual packages, very convenient, and they ship them to you in this cute little display box. So also very cute. All you have to do is take a short little quiz on their website to see what vitamins and supplements are going to be the most helpful for you and your routine. You can also substitute or add on vitamins that you're already on that your doctor has recommended you take. Add them all together and they'll ship them on over to you so you have them all in these cute little pouches. I personally take a vitamin B12, vitamin D, vitamin C, magnesium, omega-3 fish oil, and a probiotic blend. Like I said earlier, right now I'm absolutely in a phase where I have totally fallen out of routine with a lot of the best self-care habits that I have been in for a long time. I do accountability group with my friends once a month and this month, to start off the month, I was like, my goal, my theme for this month is BTB, baby. We're going back to basics. And that includes Maddie getting back on all of her routines and all the habits that make me feel the best and make my body feel good and alive and excited to do life every morning when I wake up. So if you're also struggling in your routines right now, don't worry, me too. <laughs> but I'm just trying to get back into it one step at a time and starting with vitamins, remembering to take my pills, setting an alarm on my phone so that I don't forget to take them is a good first step for me. I'm happy that this is where I'm at right now. So if you guys are also interested in incorporating some vitamins into your life and trying out Care Of, you can go to takecareof.com and use code MADDIEDRAG50 for 50% off your first order, or you can just go ahead and click the link in the description down below. My salmon smells so good right now. I think it is about to be done in the oven, so I'm gonna go enjoy that. And thank you again, Care Of, for sponsoring today's video. Let's go. This is one of those meals that became a staple to me when I was seeing my nutritionist, whom I love and who changed my life so completely. I have had so many body image issues and so many issues with food throughout my life. And a big like pillar of my conversations with her as far as like food goes, was just talking about learning how to make meals more colorful. It really is amazing like how much better things feel, how much easier they sit in your body. Um, when you boil them down to like the terms you would use to describe it to a young child. It was the same thing with like me calling uh, exercise recess and how that made my brain more excited and less anxious about it all, less fearful about going to work out and sharing that space with other people, feeling super self-conscious and like other people were always looking at me, which actually is a great segue into another question that popped up in that box, which was just a question about gym culture and what I feel about it. And you have to find something that works for you, right? I don't like working out in a gym. It's never gonna be my thing. My anxiety gets so much higher there. I feel so much more aware of my body and how other people might be perceiving me. I don't think that anybody has to go to the gym if you don't wanna go to the gym. There are so many different ways to bring in more joyful movement to your life. If the gym isn't the location for you, that's totally fine. It's not the location for me either. The truth is that like, 
my relationship with my body, with movement, with exercise feels really personal. And it doesn't feel like something I want to explore around other people. Even if they're not watching me, it still feels like there's an audience there. And the truth is that like, it's vulnerable unless it is creative movement, which is why I love dance so much because whoa, you can't let people know that this is a lawless land that we live in, Mango. Who says you're allowed up here? Who says you're allowed up here? Whatever. This is real, this is me. This is how we do it over here, the Drossback household. Don't worry, I wipe down the fucking surfaces every day. But this is her house. I like, I just live here and pay all the bills, but like, this is for sure her house. You should get down though. You should for sure get off the table. <laughs> this is the difference between cat owners and dog owners. <laughs> That is a kind of movement that I enjoy that doesn't even feel like exercise to me. I have so much fun when I'm doing it. I forget that I'm sweating. And because I'm having so much fun, I don't find myself as uh, like anxious about what other people must be thinking. Does that mean it never comes up? Absolutely not. There are some days where I'll walk into the dance studio and I will feel like so overwhelmed with what I used to be able to do in dance and what I am capable of doing now. I compare myself to like, my 16 year old self and what I was capable of doing then. I don't often compare myself to other people at dance just because I feel like the studio I go to is full of beginners. So it's not like there's anybody in my classes that's like light years more advanced than the rest of us. So I think that also helps when you're working out with a lot of people that are at a similar stage that you are. But I definitely find myself comparing myself to my past self and when thoughts like that pop up i try to just sort of step out of myself for a second and observe them and be like okay this is something that i'm feeling right now this is something that's coming up for me i am comparing myself to a much much younger version of myself and we're here today feet planted firmly in reality i'm 27 years old and i showed up here and I'm having fun, and I'm moving my body for the joy and love of it all, okay? I'm not here to be the best dancer in the room, I'm here to fucking enjoy myself and move my body and show love to my body through dance, okay? So comparison doesn't have a spot here. So I'm gonna observe it, I'm gonna notice it, and then I'm gonna move past it, and I'm gonna show up the way that I need to show up for my present self, because I deserve that. And also I'm killing it now too, and there's just no reason for it. You know, in 10 years, I'm gonna look back at the version of myself that exists today and be like, ah, oh, she was fucking awesome. So I try my best to just remember and remind myself in the moment that I am fucking awesome today. And I don't need to be a version of myself that existed 10 years ago, 11 years ago. I need to be the version of myself that exists today. And honestly, I'm proud of myself for getting to the place I am now with my body and with food and the, the efforts that I've taken to find what works for me. Because the truth is that a lot of like typical and popular food and wellness advice does not work for me. I'm someone that used to have terrible body image and an eating disorder. On top of the fact that I'm very critical of a lot of health culture because I think it's incredibly fat phobic. So the popular advice, what works for a lot of other people is not gonna work for me and that's totally fine. So if you don't want to go to the gym, you don't have to go to the gym. I think it's better to find what works for you. What works for me is taking walks outside around my neighborhood and going to dance class. That's what makes me feel good. That's what makes my body feel good. Going to the gym just makes me feel anxious and overexposed and unsafe, to be fucking honest with you. So I don't go. And I don't think that you have to go if you don't want to go. There are plenty of other ways to move your body. Ooh, okay. Three top dinner party essentials. A bottle of Santa Margarita Pinot Grigio. That's my mom's favorite and it has become my favorite as well. Taper candles for the vibes. And last but certainly not least, a playlist full of romantic jazz music. You have those three things at a dinner party, it's gonna be good no matter what else goes on. <laughs> if you could preserve one artifact for the Lover Girls Worldwide Museum, what would it be? I'm taking these questions from memory because clearly I don't have anything written in front of me, so. I'm paraphrasing. I'm a very sentimental person, so I save a lot of things. And um, I have a movie ticket from my second date with the first guy I ever had like intense feelings for. I always hesitate to say I loved him because he was so cruel to me 
that I just, I don't think of that as love because that is not how you treat people that you love. Now, I think I had a lot of love in my heart for him and I, I, I find myself very sweet and endearing to look back on, even though he was so fucking cruel and so mean to me and literally never deserved an ounce of my sweetness. I hold on to those sentimental things, not for him, but for me, because it was me getting to discover that part of my heart and to feel what it feels like. And I've met people since that I liked 20,000 times more than I liked him that are better matches for me, kinder to me than he was. So now I look back on it all and I'm like, yeah, he was the worst, but I hang on to these little sentimental things, not for him, but for me, because it was the first time I ever felt that way. And so anyways, I have a movie stub from our second date. We went to go see The Breakfast Club at the IFC Center. Um, and I had sex for the first time with him almost immediately after this movie. I slept over his apartment and then in the morning we had sex. But this was a midnight movie, so I guess the, the movie ticket probably says the day I had sex for the first time on it too, which is kind of special. But that to me is like an artifact that goes in the Lover Girls Museum. Found it. <laughs> the Breakfast Club. 12.05 a.m. The IFC Center. 2-6-2016. This is a fucking relic, mama. This is going to the museum. Sleepy Girl Mocktails. Do I buy it? No. Do I love anything cute and a little gimmicky? Yeah, fucking obviously. Step one, take your favorite glass and put an absurdly large ice cube in it because it just feels fancier that way. Then you're supposed to take some tart cherry juice. I cannot find that, so instead I have cranberry juice. Urinary tract health. I care about it. <laughs> Next, top it off with a little bit of cherry limeade poppy. My personal favorite flavor. And then at the very end, just when you think you're done, take a little slice of lime, squeeze it in there, Drop it on top, boom. You're feeling fancy, you're feeling free. You have a cute little drink to help you wind down. Now I'll be honest, did I really need help winding down in the sleepy sense today or ever? No, I didn't. Some of you are gonna hate me for this, but it is a truth about me that I need to share with you. I am one of those sick, twisted people that can fall asleep in about 15 seconds flat. I never have a hard time falling asleep. In fact, I can do it so quickly it even shocks me. I close my eyes for too long and I'm asleep. <laughs> so do I need a drink to trick me into thinking I'm getting more tired and winding down? No, because the truth is that I can wind down whenever I need to wind down. But also the trade-off here is that I'm someone that hates naps because naps make me feel nauseous. Anytime I've ever taken a nap in my life, unless it's been like gun to my head, my eyes are closing, it's an involuntary nap. If I've ever taken a voluntary nap, I wake up and feel nauseous until I get a full night's sleep. It's just my whole day is ruined if I take a nap. So that's the handoff that I have had to make. I am anti-nap. However, I can fall asleep for a full 10 hours whenever I need. <laughs> what are you proud of lately? Something I have been proud of lately is my commitment to remaining true to who I am at my core. And I mean that in multiple ways. I mean it, yes, in a sense of like, I've really shown up for myself emotionally. I've been truthful to how I feel. I've shared everything that I felt. I've really worn my fucking heart on my sleeve and I continue to, and that feels really good to be so in alignment with my most vulnerable self and to just feel proud of myself for not you know, shoving any part of myself in a corner, even when it's hard. I also mean it in the sense of like opportunities that have presented themselves to me that I have not taken. Situations where I have stood up for myself, where I have asked questions and really like done the difficult work of making sure I'm getting what I deserve in professional settings. And it's not always easy to do that, to stand up for yourself and stand your ground and stick to what you know is in alignment with your values and your beliefs and your heart and what you stand for as a person. It's not always the most fruitful path, but it is the one that feels the most in alignment with my highest self. So it is the one that I choose. And I'm just proud of myself for never compromising who I am at the end of the day. Not for someone else, not for money, not for success, not for nothing. <laughs>
What is your favorite cry on the subway song? This is a huge question. This is honestly like so fucking loaded. I can't even believe that you would ask me this. <laughs> I'm kidding. But it's like, there's so many answers. What is my, I don't know. I'm a yearner, okay? At the end of the day, I am a yearner. A song, there's so many songs that I could cry every time I listen to. Okay, first of all, Vanilla Twilight by Owl City. Shut the fuck up. It's a great song. When violet eyes get brighter and heavy wings grow lighter, I'll taste the sky and feel alive again and I'll forget the world that I knew but I swear I won't forget you. Oh, if my voice could reach back through the past, I'd whisper in your ear. Oh, darling, I wish you were here. Bars, bitch bars that is a song that makes me cry see i'm not i don't often get like i want to listen to like depressing music sad i'm like a melodramatic yearning kind of sad so when i feel sad and heartbroken and i need something to cry to crying on the subway level we gotta cry i'm listening to like the vanilla twilights and the only exceptions of the world, you know what I mean? Like I wanna listen to something that's like, just feels like you're sitting there being like, ah, oh, fuck, ah. Or we're turning it up a notch completely and we're listening to like Blackout Days by Fantagram. Bitch, the amount of hours that I spent crying on public transportation to Blackout Days by Fantagram, don't talk to me. But I'm definitely like a one tear going down the face, looking out the window, life passing you by kind of crier. I don't often get to a place where I'm like doom and gloom. I've been listening to a heartbreak playlist I made back in 2016 a lot lately because to be perfectly fucking honest with you, I have not been heartbroken since 2016. <laughs> So we're going way back these days. <laughs> Not that I haven't had my feelings hurt since 2016. Obviously I've had my feelings hurt many times since 2016. I think I'm just realizing that like I haven't had strong feelings for someone in a very long time. So we've been going deep into the archives for my, my playlists of choice these days. Let me, oh, okay. Don't make fun of me for this. I have cried to World of Chances by Demi Lovato more times than I know what to do with. The Herald Song by Kesha. Yeah, yeah. They say that true love hurts. Well, this could almost kill me. Young love murder. That is what this must be. Yeah, she was eating and devouring. Loud Places by Jamie XX. That's been a big one lately. But I'll be so fucking real with you. Even in the midst of heartbreak, I still only want to listen to love songs. So. I've been listening to a lot of Baby I'ma Want You by Bread. <laughs> the truth is that I'm just an optimist and I really do believe that whatever does happen is supposed to happen and whatever is meant to happen is gonna happen anyways. So there's no use getting too tied up in what's happening right now because we just don't know what's coming right around the corner. That's not to say I don't get sad. I cry most days of the week, mama. <laughs> but I think I just process my sadness in a more like yearning towards the future kind of way. The melodrama, the yearning, the longing, the missing, but it's still happy and sweet. I don't often get like angry, I guess, like sad and angry. Even though Black Oat Days by Fantagram is kind of fucking angry, but it's, I, I hear it and it sits in my body as like a, no, no, not like a, no, you know what I mean? All right, it's time to get this makeup off my face, do a little skincare. This mango keeps reminding me that it is past our bedtime. What is your letterboxed top four and why? Oh, I love this question and I'll do you one better. I'll give you my top four and I'll give you my four most recently watched in theaters. How about that? First step to any banger, get on ready with me is of course the Pharmacy Green Clean Cleansing Balm. This is the best cleansing balm. Don't bother with any other cleansing balm. You'll use this once and be like, oh, okay. I get it. Okay, in the number one position, I have Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs is my favorite movie of all time. I love Anthony Hopkins. I love Jodie Foster. Silence of the Lambs was really like my introduction to a real classic thriller. I didn't know that I loved that genre until I saw Silence of the Lambs. I've talked about it before on my podcast. When I was younger, I used to hate 
horror. And what I'm about to say is gonna sound a little sad, but I'll reassure you in saying that I've done a lot of processing in therapy with professionals about this. So I'm okay, don't worry about me. But I hated horror when I was a kid. Was just so scared of everything. I need to take my rings off before I do this, what am I doing? And then I endured a traumatic event. I was at the Boston bombings in 2013 with my whole family. My mom had crossed the finish line like right before it happened. In the aftermath of experiencing that, I got really into the horror genre because I think it was a way for me to learn how to harness fear and control fear rather than having fear control me. I don't know, I just think that indulging in horror and thriller made me feel like I had more control over something that I had absolutely no control over whatsoever. I also didn't go to therapy for the first time until like halfway through college and I was a sophomore in high school when this happened. So that was my way of coping. Diving into horror and thriller movies as a way to like harness my fear and gain back some like control over my fears and anxiety that I felt like I had um, really lost in that experience. And now my face, super fresh, no makeup in sight. Next up, I'm going in with my water cleanser, which is the CeraVe Hydrating Facial Cleanser. So anyways, Hell's Hole Lamps was just like one of my first exposures to the thriller genre, which is my favorite genre to this day. I wrote like every single one of my college essays on Silence of the Lambs, because I just I love it so goddamn much. In my number two spot is Gone Girl. I fucking love Gone Girl. I love Amy Dunn. I love the fucking drama of it all. It's everything to me. The cool girl monologue, I can recite it in my sleep. I also picked the cool girl monologue whenever I had to pick monologues for my acting classes in college. <laughs> I could watch Gone Girl every day for the rest of my life and not get bored. That is how much I fucking love that movie. In my third spot, and I understand this is largely controversial, but it's my truth and I'm gonna live in it and I'm sorry some of you don't know how to have fun. Uh, it's Saltburn. Saltburn was an immediate five stars for me. I saw it, I loved, I lived, I laughed, okay? I saw it like a day after it officially came out in New York. So it was before it came out nationwide. And yeah, I was just fully on board, fully sold. It has everything that I want in a movie. Jacob Elordi with an eyebrow piercing, incredible cinematography, Rosamund Pike who I would take a bullet for. I've honestly talked about Saltburn too much, so I'm just gonna sort of graze over it because everyone's tired of hearing me talk about Saltburn, but I, I just love that movie, I do. And I'm sorry that not everyone knows how to have fun. <laughs> Next up, I'm gonna use the Coco Kind Rose Water Toner. Just give myself a little spritz. And then in my fourth position, this one recently got swapped in. I only saw this movie for the first time in this past September, so I was very late. But in my fourth spot, I have When Harry Met Sally. Really, I just needed at least one romance movie in my top four because it would just be a crime if I didn't. Oh, I didn't even tell you what I was doing. I'm so sorry, I'm so fucking rude. Now moving on to serums, I've got the Ordinary Hyaluronic Acid Serum and the Experiment Super Saturated Serum. This is the most important item in my skincare routine. I thank this singular product for why my skin looks so hydrated and gorgeous and plump all the time, all right? This is all you fucking need. I love When Harry Met Sally, and I think why it feels like such a perfect romance movie to me is in the beginning, you're convinced you hate both of them. <laughs> 20 minutes into the movie, I was like, I'm gonna fucking hate this movie. This guy sucks. Like, there's no way I'm gonna like this. And the fact that you like so passionately feel that towards the beginning and then by the end, you're like, I'm so shocked, but I've been completely won over by these people. And I get it and I get them. And I feel like I've been here and I just, oh fuck, why do I like them? <laughs> But what used to be in my fourth spot is Memento. Weirdo, freaky, non-linear movies. Live, laugh, love for those, okay? I love an experimental movie, a movie that really takes risks, and Memento does just that. So I did replace Memento with When Harry Met Sally, but make no mistake, Memento still has a very special place in my heart. Next up, I'm using the Glow Recipe Plum Plump Hyaluronic cream. This is one of my favorite moisturizers. Something a little lighter now that we're moving into spring or I'm 
manifesting us moving into spring by using my spring and summer moisturizer. Okay, now I'm telling you about the last four movies that I saw in theaters. I have an Alamo Draft House season pass, so I see a lot of movies, and also at Alamo they play older movies and newer movies, so my recent watches are a mix of both. I saw Reality Bites, which is a 90s movie, yesterday. I gotta be honest, you guys, I didn't like it. <laughs> And I think it's because I find both of the main characters to be completely unlikable. So the ending is super unsatisfying because I was preying on their downfall the entire time. And then I felt like neither of them really got the comeuppance that I personally would have given them for being that fucking annoying. So... <laughs> Then a few days before that, I saw Suspiria 2018. I really loved it. Right up my alley, that kind of movie. I am gonna be a hater for a second though and ask the question on everybody's lips. Why the fuck was Dakota Johnson cast in that role? <laughs> I really loved the movie and I don't even necessarily think that Dakota Johnson did a bad job. I just am not the biggest fan of her acting style and think there are so many people that would have been better suited in that role. So the whole movie I felt distracted because in my head I was like recasting the role with everyone I would have wanted to see in it because she was the lead, but I didn't feel that she was even close to the strongest in that cast and I would have liked it more if she was, if somebody was cast in that role who could have fulfilled that for me. I know a lot of people love her in that movie. I'm not one of them. I did love the movie though, I gave it four stars. All right, next up, since I'm going to bed and I'm trying to be slimy, okay? I'm looking to be as wet as possible right now. I'm looking to be hydrated as fuck. So I'm going in with the Experiment Buffer Jelly. It's a barrier boosting oil gel and it just is gonna lock in all of this hydration. Then I saw Love Lies Bleeding gay Kristen Stewart movie, yeah, absolutely, sign me the fuck up. It was incredible, I loved it, four and a half stars. That movie made me audibly gasp. I was living, I was laughing, I was loving, and there was a man sat next to me in the theater who, first of all, he shouldn't have even been let in. <laughs> but right after the movie, he turns to the person next to him and he was like, it was all right, I thought I took some liberties that I probably shouldn't have taken. I was like, shut up. This isn't for you. Did you not get that? This was for the gays, okay? Did you not get that? Did you not soak that one in? Did you not realize that this was for lesbians and bisexuals? Shut up. You shut up. <laughs> Last but not least, I'm going in with my Laneige sleeping mask. <laughs> and then before that, I saw Problemista, which I ate the fuck up. I also gave that a four and a half stars. Ridiculously funny. I was laughing out loud for so much of that movie. Tilda Swinton deserves everything good that happens to her in this lifetime, and I mean that sincerely, sweetie. Sincerely. This camera is crazy. How did you discover your love languages? I mean, the thing about love languages is that, like, we all speak all of them. It's not like there are some love languages that people are like, no. I'm a quality time person, never ever give me words of affirmation. Like obviously they're all great, but you have ones that you lean towards. I don't know, I think I find myself switching up, moving through what my love languages are dependent on the person, the era, the specific relationship. Quality time has long been my number one with acts of service following that up pretty closely, but I think gifts is climbing the charts for me the older that I get. And I think that gifts gets a bad rap because people equate gifts to money, but that's not true. You can get a bouquet of flowers that you picked from the garden yourself and attach a little note on a string to it, which I guess is words of affirmation, but a note to me is also a gift. A written note, that's words of affirmation and a gift combined. But there's just something so special about someone seeing you and remembering something about you and then getting a gift for you, personalized, because they were thinking of you. But the reason why I say that my love languages change situationally is because I really believe that's true. Like for example, in recent memory, this is something that stuck with me, but a few months ago I had a corrupted audio file the, the dreaded thing to occur to anyone that creates content. I was so upset about losing this episode. It was just like, 
yeah, I ruined my whole day. I was so upset about it. And I was seeing my friends later that night. And obviously this is a corrupted memory card, corrupted file. There's nothing anyone can do about it. There's no act of service that can be done. There was nothing that anyone could say to make me feel better. But when I showed up to trivia that night, my friend Jordan had brought me a slice of cheesecake. And in that moment, that was exactly what I needed. There was nothing to say, there was nothing to do. I was sad and I was frustrated and my friend brought me a dessert that she knows that I love. And that made me feel so warm in that moment. It made me feel so thought of and remembered. Jordan knew I was having a bad day and she went out and she got me something that she knew was gonna cheer me up. She thought of me, she remembered something about me and she did this thing to make me feel better, to show that she cared. That was so meaningful to me and it's something I'll remember forever. But I thought that was such a clear example of when like my typical love languages maybe weren't the go-to. In that moment, a gift was the thing that was gonna work the best to make me feel better. And obviously quality time, spending time with the people that I love, that's really, quality time is unbeatable to me because that is always, there's never a situation where quality time is a bad thing. I think quality time is just like 100% always the fucking best. And then like acts of service, words of affirmation, gifts feel like very tied for me. And then physical touch is actually at the bottom for me. Not that I don't love physical touch or need physical touch, obviously I fucking do. But of all of them, physical touch is definitely the thing I think about the least. And I think that's probably because the range of importance of physical touch really varies depending on relationship. Every single close relationship in my life, I want to be spending quality time with. I want to be having the words of affirmation exchanged, acts of service, gifts, like I want all of those things with everyone in my life. Physical touch for me though is very much reserved for the people that I am the closest with. I'm not someone that likes to engage in physical touch with everyone in my life, even if it's just a hug. I am doing it more as like a social thing and not as like a, I really need a hug this person even though they're not in like my closest inner circle. Like physical touch only feels important to me with like select people. Otherwise, I don't need to be touching all these people. No, I don't, I don't need people's hands on me. I don't, I really don't. So I don't know, all of them are important, but I think if you just pay attention to yourself and what you gravitate towards, you'll be able to figure out which ones are most important to you usually. But really, I think love languages are more helpful when you accept that like they all are gonna apply in different circumstances. Oh, whoa, I think this sleepy girl mocktail's working. Me and my little princess baby over here need to go to bed. Oh, I'm so excited to go to bed. I'm gonna have a wonderful night's sleep. And I'm gonna wake up in the morning, make myself a little coffee, and go get a bagel from Bake Shop. Ah, it's gonna be so 